All right. <coughs> so we are here on September 8th. All right. Next week, 9.15, chapter 4, That's enough future. So now the adversary has finally passed. So uh, next week, there will begin to be some points taken off if you're late. Up till now, anybody late is forgiven. I'm not counting until after 9 8, which is next week. Anyway, so, um, all right. And I recommend that you do the quizzes before the lecture, but it's only going to be enforced to whatever extent I actually get around to enforcing it next week. Anyway, um, anybody got any questions about anything? Usual stuff before we get going? Yeah. Uh, I think it might have, but it's but you, we won't get any lose any points until next week. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm I've got two copies of due dates I use in Canvas, and I haven't yet learned how to properly synchronize everything. Um, oh, there's two. You get two chances. Yeah. So one, two, two chances. Well, that, yeah, that's all I've done. I mean, I guess if, if people need more, I could open up more, but I think it's enough. I just keep going. There's tons of extra credit. I mean, if you're actually worried about the points, I would just not worry. Because there's all these extra credit projects, and uh, they make more than make up for it, yeah. all the quizzes. Yeah. So that's good. And if, and if anybody has any special problems, let me know. Because um, the only purpose of the quizzes is really to make people study. Yeah. I used to try to make them a measurement of performance, and I realized that it's more effective to just use them as a teaching tool. So that's why um, I've had complaints from Steve Nelson, who gets students' jobs, that people are getting A's in my class and they don't know anything. I said, yeah, that is a side effect of not having uh, the measurement of performance, but I think it's worth it because the people that seriously want to learn are encouraged to learn more. That's, and I think that's been a problem all the way back to Plato, that there are people who just do the minimum required of them to get a good grade, but they don't actually know anything. So I hope um, you understand that these things are my classes are an attempt to aid you in learning. And if you play it like a game to do the minimum effort and get the highest score, you're cheating yourself. I mean, but anyway, um, so I want to talk about this chapter three, but let me just point out a couple of news articles are very interesting I just found and they're worth mentioning. Um, yeah, this one and this one. And there's other ones about WannaCry and stuff that are good too, but these two particular ones are very good for this class. This one here just came out as a list of 10 process injection techniques on Windows, and we are going to go through these. They all look familiar. They're all in this class, and they're all in 126 also. In this class, you do them, and in 126, you detect them from the other end. So um, I'll just mention them as you go by. This is Dill Injection, the one I mentioned before, because Microsoft Windows programs load code at runtime, you can just tell the code, oh, load this other library too, pull by malware and run that along with your code. That would be swell. And it says, sure, it doesn't. So that's really handy. And then there's um, portable execution injection, where you add into the code of a PE file. And there are many other variants on that. Process hollowing is the one I've seen before, where you have a running process, you rip out the code and replace it with new code and let it run ahead. It continues to think it's still the old process. That's pretty awesome. And we've already been seeing that happen, using that one in the uh, malware um, analysis class. And here's where you suspend, replace it, and then resume, and you change it in between, which is closely similar to the last one. And then there's hook injection, which is how current keyloggers tend to work. Microsoft has these things called hooks, where when an event happens, it interrupts the process and calls other code, and you can add your code to the hooks, like the exception handlers, so it will run other code in addition to the previous code. And here's another one. There's many, many. These are called the auto start extensibility points, and there are more of them. These are registry keys that tell Microsoft Windows to run code under certain conditions. 
um, to launch it during startup because it's an essential background service and so on. And of course, the reason why Microsoft is so full of this stuff is because they're the all-purpose operating system. So they support every possible strange combination of hardware and software. So you can invent something new like a wireless keyboard or something where everything in the whole machine requires on knowing where that keyboard is, but it uses some bizarre driver. So there are all these features to make it possible to automatically load your bizarre code before anything else happens. So I can totally use it to load my malware. It's the problem. Microsoft is always thinking about supporting all the things people use it for. And of course, all those extra features can be abused as well. So app init dills are more of these things that automatically add dills to libraries and other kinds of dills, image file execution options. There's a bunch of registry keys that say under these conditions, run this other code here and you can just use them to run malware. Then there's APC injection we're gonna go through. I haven't heard this called atom bombing before, but these are asynchronous procedure calls, another process injection, another uh, process running system in Windows that you can abuse. And then extra window memory injection. This is the one I think that was new to me. You can tell Windows, once after you've opened a window and you put it on the taskbar, you can say, oh, add some extra memory so I can add more code to that window that's running. <laughs> Once again, um, so again, it's a way to add more QR code to things. Then there's shims. I heard about these a while ago. There's a variety of shims out there which are intended to handle things like version changes. So you have code running on Windows 98. Then you want to run it on Windows 10. So you put in a shim, which will try to translate the, old, the new stuff to the old stuff. And you can put a malicious shim in, of course. There's a variety of those. And then there's IHE hooking and inline hooking, and these are usually in root kits, and we're gonna go through these in detail in 126. I'm not so sure here, but there we talk about how to change the, uh, the main lookup table to find system routines. Anyway, maybe I'll close that door. the competition class got them good and excited, which is the way it should be. Anyway, so, all right. Anyway, that's a good list. And here's another one. This is a new trick that just came out today. Um, this is how to break into HTTPS. And it is, um, what you do is you go to a HTTPS seller, certificate seller, and many of them are vulnerable to this attack. They have not yet released exactly which ones are vulnerable. But the point is, while you are buying your certificate, they do a check of your domain and they use an ordinary garden variety DNS lookup for that. And DNS runs over UDP and is easily intercepted and spoofed. So they found a way to uh, intercept the DNS traffic and fragment it so that the authentication part goes through and then I change the part after the authentication part. Um, this, this shouldn't be possible, but it's happened many times. Uh, one case like this I know, which comes up in the Android device class, is um, messing with... Uh, there's an authentication system used by a lot of mobile apps. The name escapes me at the moment, but you have a, uh, oh, it's called um, XML, some markup language, SAML, Security Assertion Markup Language, is how you tell a server, you're something like a cell phone, and you want to tell the server, I have logged in as Sam. So you send the server a security assertion, which is I am logged in as this user, and there's a markup language, and there's cryptographic signatures on it. But early versions of the libraries, to the extent of like 11 of the 13 most popular libraries in use about five years ago, all had enormous defects. And one of the common defects was you could have one assertion, like I am the administrator, followed by a signature, and that would be fine. But you could put the code that verified the signature, assume there was only one assertion, but the code that after that, it went to the next routine, which implemented the assertions, and it did not make that assumption. So all I had to do was make a valid assertion that says I am Sam, and then add a second assertion to the same message that says I'm the administrator. And the first one will say, are you Sam? Well, okay, you're really Sam. The next one will say, okay, this stuff is all approved. He's he Sam, he's the administrator, and now you're in. Because the stage that used it was separated from the stage that decided it was okay. And they didn't know what each other were doing, and that's what happened here. So they're able to spoof the <coughs> DNS process so the signature is unmodified, but the actual content is different. So they're able to trick the provider into selling you a certificate for a domain you do not own and get a valid certificate for somebody else's domain. So anyway, I thought those are good, exciting things. And now I'm going to get into probably the most assembly that we're going to do in this class, um, which is pretty fun, not too daunting. And we'll see it go. So, um, 
All right, so we're going to talk about protection rings and syscalls. Syscall is the main uh, point of this stuff, and we'll use some tools, objdump and NASM and LD and strace to analyze uh, assembly code, to, to analyze ectric executables, and uh, we'll see, we'll make very simple uh, shell code from scratch. First, we'll make shell code that just exits, and then we'll make shell code that calls um, uh, a, that can execute any command line, command, to talk to our shell. And that's as far as we're going to go for this part, because uh, we are not really going to make a lot of shell code in this class, despite the title of the book. We're mostly going to use tools to make the shell code, but you, this is the one chapter where we actually make some simple shell code, so you see what is involved in making shell code. And the heart of it all is syscall. The point of, now, so shell code is nothing more than normal executable software that has been shrunk to be as small as possible and then re-engineered to remove forbidden characters like nulls. That's all it is. However, this has some strange effects. And one of the strange effects is there's usually no error handling at all. Now, I teach workshops called Violent Python, and I've had people say I should just be fired. Nobody should use this horrible book. I use Violent Python. It's terrible because it teaches you to be a rotten coder because real coders spend most of their effort catching all the exceptions. You think of, here comes some data. What if the data is too long? What if it's too short? What if it has unexpected characters? What if it has some relationship to this other data? You have to make sure you've thought of every possible combination yeah. and handled them correctly so that your code doesn't crash or have big security holes. But if you are trying to just do an attack, then you don't care about any of that. You don't mind if your attack fails half the time and if it doesn't give you any error message. You just want it to work sometimes enough so that I can get in. So you have a whole different attitude. And so um, that's going on here. Shell code has no error handling. So one thing about shell code is if anything's wrong at all, it just crashes. This, my introduction to this was using Metasploit shell code. I used reverse connections. I'd send on, execute this shell code that was supposed to connect back to me. And if there was a network problem, so it couldn't reach me, it would just crash. Because it can't even say timeout or anything. And I'm like, why is my shell code crashing? What's wrong? And there's nothing wrong with the shell code. The problem is my command and control server is not running. And I didn't know that will cause the code to crash, but it totally does. It, because it's just shrunk down to the bare minimum. So it does, if anything bad happens, it doesn't handle this at all. It just crashes. So that's one thing to get used to. But anyway, typically what you want to do is spawn a root shell, for example, for a privilege escalation following attack. So the part of this is syscall. Now syscall is the basic window from user land to kernel land. And that's where you have to go to get in touch with the hardware. So syscall contacts the kernel. So if I want to read from the input, I, I tell the user to type in your password at the keyboard, I have to use a syscall because I'm not allowed to touch the keyboard. And user land is their own little protected zone. You can't touch the hardware. All you can do is ask the kernel, please go talk to the keyboard and let me know what the keyboard says. <clears throat> so that's what happens here. Same thing, putting out, executing a, a process or launching a new process. All these things require uh, touching the hardware and you're not authorized to do that. So you have to ask the kernel to please do it for you. So these are the protection rings, and this is built into the processor and the motherboard. You have four rings available, zero to three, although in practice, they were never used. One and two were only used by some really old system, I think Linux or something, that was never used. The only ones that are used now are zero and three, and now we have minus one, which is hardware virtualization. That's the modern hotness because now you're running virtual machines on the hardware and there's special assembly language consideration just for that. And we're, that's, we're not touching that in this class. The book is too old and I don't know about it, but that is, that's what people call, that's the real new ring that's up there. And this is, I hope you've gotten used to this. If you're learning the TCP IP stack or the OSI model or anything, it's always, there's a original idea and then in practice, all these rules are broken because people write real code that mixes these together, invents a new one. The OSI model, you had layer two with MAC addresses, and you had layer three with IP addresses, and immediately Cisco came out with VLANs, which are in between, and you just go on that way. That's the way it always is. This, any, any simple rule like this is true in general, and the details always mess it up. But anyway, here's the main things we care about. Ring three is user land. Everything that is a child of Explorer that you launch, like, like start typing a finding a program or double clicking an icon, that runs in user land, which is where you're supposed to be. And the kernel land 
is supposed to be designed by professionals that wrote the operating system and you're not supposed to mess with it. You're supposed to stay in user land. And if you are in user land, then if you write a program and your program has an error and it crashes, it doesn't kill the computer. It has time to pop up a message because the kernel is still running intact, which is why um, Microsoft gets a real attitude about this because um, ever since Windows XP, um, back in the days of Windows 95 and Windows 98 and MS-DOS, Microsoft invented the blue screen of death, which is the last resort error message. If the kernel crashes, you're hosed. The machine is irretrievably down. There's no way to come back up. And Microsoft invented this blue screen of death to tell you some information about the crash. And then the problem is every device driver has to be in kernel land. So everybody that makes a network card or a printer has to write a driver. Yeah? Oh, good. Thank you. I often don't see those. Let's see. Maybe there's something odd. It's Intel Management Engine. Exploit vul work. Yeah, in the kernel ring. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I think there are exploits. Oh, the Intel Management Engine. Yeah, I've heard about that. There's a few of those. I think it does work. I don't have a project, but it would be good to. Um, there are some hardware listening ports intended for remote management. And uh, yeah, here's the kernel ring. Yeah, good. That's a good link. Oh, you should. we should probably make that public. You sent it to me privately so I don't you can't see it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and save this later and put that up. But that's true. There are some interesting vulnerabilities. Oh, there he sent it to everyone. Good. So everybody can see it on this. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. These are good points. Anyway. So the kernel is now contains not just code written by your operating system vendor, but code written by everybody that made devices. And then there's a race to the bottom to make the cheapest devices. So when you buy a $10 NIC from China instead of a $30 NIC, you're probably getting a NIC that was designed for Windows 98 and a driver that was designed for Windows 98. And they found out that all you have to do is change the metadata that says, sure, it'll run on Windows 10 and sell it to people. And it mostly runs on Windows 10, but it doesn't really handle all the situations right. So it causes the whole thing to die with the blue screen of death. And this is why Microsoft got very upset and they started enforcing more and more rules on what you can put in the kernel. And they tried to lock everybody out of the kernel with Vista. They wanted to switch from BIOS to UEFI so when your machine boots up, they can validate a digital signature of the kernel before it starts, which is what the iPhone and the iPad do. And they said, now, if it does not match the signature, meaning the entire kernel is 100% intact code from Microsoft, it will refuse to boot up and say, your machine is broken, go, take it, go get it fixed. This would end kernel mode rootkits, but it would also end um, antivirus software, all of which puts unauthorized non-Microsoft code in the kernel. And... Uh, the antivirus companies threatened Microsoft with a lawsuit if they dared to enforce that, so they never did, except for the ARM-based Windows 8 tablet, which nobody else got. So anyway, this is a big issue, um, and uh, that is now an option you can turn on in some version of Windows, but it's not very common. Anyway, let me see if I can get this extra window off the screen because it's kind of in the way, and we'll carry on. All right, so, all right, so protected kernel mode um, is here. So that if you are in user land and you have a problem, you send an error message, if you try to access kernel memory from user land, you'll get an access exception saying you're not allowed to read that, get lost. So if you do want to do something with the kernel, you cannot just read or jump into it. What you do is you use syscall. And syscall is an interrupt process. All the way back to the really old days of MS-DOS, interrupts are how you demand immediate service so the program will stop whatever it's doing and go do something else and then come back. And this is int 80. All right, so every time you touch hardware, you have to do a syscall, which is done with interrupts, at least in the early versions. So live C is the functions that perform syscalls. And these are all the functions like printf and scanf and exit, all the things you use, the common C library routines you use to do everything that involves touching the hardware. So you call something like malloc to reserve some space, and it seems to work, but what it's really done is go to the kernel to get the kernel to reserve that space for you because you can't do it directly. It's just so the, the traditional way to do this is interrupt 0x80. This is interrupt number 128. And this, so you load the syscall number into EIX, then you put other arguments in other registers, and then you execute int 80. Therefore, the computer, computer will stop doing what it's doing. It will switch into kernel mode instead of ring 3, execute the kernel routine, and then come back. That's how you do it. Very much like a corporate executive handing something to someone else and saying, go take care of this. And when you're done, bring me the result. You pass it to another process, which you cannot modify. All right. So let me get this junk off the screen. There's probably some way to turn it off. But anyway, all right. 
no way to get it very far off the screen. All right. Anyway. Um, all right. So the syscall number is an integer in EAX, and you may have other arguments up here in the other registers like EBX, ECX, and EGX, and so on. And uh, all right. So let's take a look at some of this stuff in 32-bit Kali. So I've got a 32-bit Kali machine running here. And I should have an SSH shell into it. Let me get rid of some of the extra things I don't need. Like that. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I don't need that anymore. Okay, there. So things should be relatively simple. Here we are. All right, good. Control X, I thought. There we are. Uh, sure, I don't care. All right. I'm going to make it bigger. Okay. So clear. All right. This is what I've done this morning, make a few demonstrations here. And so the first one is exit e.c. All right. So let's, um, all right. This is the simplest C program you can possibly imagine. All it does is exit. So it's pretty boring, but it does let us see the bare minimum case of a system call. So you compile that. GCC minus OE, there's not any special flags, that's what I was checking for. Output E, E dot C. Okay. Now I get some warnings because I didn't bother to declare the exit function first, which I should have or include a header or something, but it doesn't really matter. And now I can run my glorious program, and all it does is return without crashing. So that was exciting. And of course, the fun thing is to see what that's doing in the assembly code. So let me make this so I can flip back and forth relatively easily. And all right, so let's disassemble it and let's play with a few tricks here, which are good to know. So if I disassemble the GDB, my E, it's here. Now, if I disassemble main, it will show me the code in main. So I can, now this, you should be beginning to get familiar with this. This is the preamble. It figures out something about stack addresses. It rounds off the stack to the nearest 16 bits. Then it pushes EBP, all this junk up here, in, not the EBX, but this part up to here is the preamble, which creates a stack frame by moving EBP and ESP up to point to a new area of the stack and reserving. There's always going to be a subtraction up here. I'm not seeing it too obvious. I think it's the minus four, where you subtract enough room for the local variables. Here, I only need enough local variable to store zero which is the number I'm going to return. That's the only thing. But anyway, this creates the stack frame. This is what actually does the job. It calls something called get funk, and I've forgotten what that is, some kind of thing C does to get ready. And here, it's going to call exit. So this is the story. Um, it's going to push something out of the stack, move something into EBX, and then call exit at PLT. PLT is program linkage table. We're going to be using it a lot more later. It's one of those... Um, blocks of addresses that you use to go to a program. If you actually want to call a routine, you do not call the address of the routine directly. Because if you did, then if the operating system was upgraded and the routine's address changed, all your code would break. So you never call any uh, system function directly. You call a lookup table so that when they update the operating system, they update the routines and they update the lookup table. So the lookup table address stays the same, but the contents change to point to the right address. This way you can do things like update your windows without having to reinstall all your software. And at the other end, you might update the version of your compiler and recompile your code without updating the operating system. So there's a second lookup table on the program side. So you always jump through two lookup tables, one under the program's control and one under the operating system's control to get to operating system routines. And the PLT is one of them, and we'll be messing with it later. So we're going to let's see if we wanted to see what exit does. We can disassemble exit. And I don't know why you can't put the at PLT here, but you can't. So I can disassemble exit. And if I do, let me shove this up and try to get rid of this junk again. All right. Um, there just seems to be no way to get rid of this junk. At some point, I need to spend more time learning how to use this broadcasting system so it doesn't hog up my screen so much. Anyway, um, so now it's going to just push something onto the stack and then jump to some address here, but it doesn't tell me what's in that address, and I can't really figure out because that address is somewhere horrible, way down in kernel memory, 03A0. That's down in the first page of memory, and that's kernel land. I'm not allowed to look there. If I tried to disassemble down there, it's not going to let me. Um, star 0x3A0. 
Um, maybe it's this. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I can't disassemble. I've tried a few ways. Of course, I'm not authorized to get down there. So what you do is disassemble main and you load it. I've got to get this thing to come on. You keep hitting the wrong button. Okay. Now still something's wrong. Fine, fine. Disassemble main there. Now I want to put a break at main, the start of main. Man. All right. Now I can run the code, so it's actually run and then stops right at the start. And now if I disassemble exit, now it has changed. Now it knows how to label things. So now it tells me that I've got um, run exit handlers. Now I think I've fallen off my track. Let me go back to my slides. This is what I saw before, jump exit, jump this 3A0. And now when I disassemble exit now, yeah, that's, I still say, the point is now I can see useful labels like run exit handlers. And I can now look at that. So now that I know the, the label of this code, which is up in the part of memory I can see, I can disassemble that and I can see what an exit does. And what it does is lots and lots of junk. And ultimately it's going to do an int 80 to get out. So let me see if I can find it in my slides and then come back because it's too big. All this junk is all that error handling. I was talking about real programmers write pages of that stuff to handle all the problems. Hackers, evil hackers, just write a couple lines that break in except when there's a problem which they don't care about handling in the computer. So um, at the label exit is where the real syscall is. And you'll see down here, it pushes something 3C and then it calls exit. And so I can disassemble underscore exit to find what I came here for. I was just trying to give you a clue how you find this, if you didn't already know it. If we disassemble exit, you will now see what an exit really is, and what it really is, is a move one into EAX and an int 80. That's it. Those two instructions are what calls the system routine exit. All right. Now, it actually does two things here. It does two syscalls, which is a little more confusing than it used to be. It turns out that this is the really old fashioned way to do a syscall in 80. It's so old, it's in the original Aleph Null, smashing a stack for fun and profit, which led to this entire class and this whole discipline. But it turned out, of course, things got more complicated after that. So there are now three ways to do a syscall. And one of them is this thing called GS10. It's another way to do a syscall. There's some reason why it's considered more perfect. There's another one called sysenter, but they all do the same thing for all practical purposes. So this first one puts FC in EAF, which is 252, and calls syscall. And this one puts 1 in EAX and calls syscall. So these are simple syscall routines that have only one parameter. And if you want to know more about your syscall routines, you can look them up online. And we'll have a page later that shows them to you. But 252 is what kills all the subsidiary processes, and exit is what kills the main process. So that's the game. And I guess I just have to keep closing this thing every few minutes. Anyway, um, so, all right. So now we're going to talk about how to write shell code that will do that exit. So here's the two syscalls. The first one is exit group, which will kill the other processes associated with this one. And here's exit. So all here's the actual function used by the compiled program from the C compiler. All we really need are the two instructions in green. We need to put one in EAX and in A. And here's the uh, online syscall reference. It's here at 3M. Let me just bring it up live because that's a good link. Um, if I go to my page and I go to 3M. All right. Right, this is the glorious syscall reference. So you see, this is sysexit is one. And someplace there's 252. So I can learn more about sysexit here. This is the Linux programmer manual about it. It tells me what exit will do and so on. But syscall one is int exit. And here's the registers. They're used by it. EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. So syscall one uses EAX has to be one. And EBX is an integer for the error code that comes back. So that's it. The other registers are not used. So before calling exit, you should set EAX and EBX to something. And so it goes for the other references. So that's, this is what your machine is actually doing is a bunch of these syscalls to get anything done. 
And you look them up here, if you are gonna write your own shell code or do anything using the kernel directly, of course, most people just trust the C language developers and the operating system developers to take care of all that, and we use high-level languages. And I have to close this irritating thing yet again. There must be some way to turn off the webcam feature. I'll see if I can figure that out at some future date. Anyway, um, so here's the simplest assembly code for exit. You have to define a text section and a start, and then he says, we'll move EBX0, EAX1, and in 80. Have to have something in EBX for the return value. I'm not sure what putting a zero in there does. I imagine that means it just throws away the return value because it's not really an address of somewhere to put it. But anyway, that's the smallest possible code. So let's look, take a look at that. If I do that here, get out of this assembler, and that is probably exit.asm. All right. So there's my code, and in order to compile this one, since it's written in assembler, I have to use NASM. I can't use GCC, because it's not C. I use NASM, minus F, ELF means make Linux code. Executable link format is the Linux standard format. I assemble it, that creates object code, which is not runnable yet, because it has to be linked. LD is what links it. Um, and then that creates um, exit.shellcode, which is executable. So let's do that, and I'm gonna make it Fit up here so I can see what I'm doing. All right, so it's load or link minus O exit shell code and exit dot O. And then, um, whoops, I had been supposed to do NASM first. The reason that works is because I've already done it here. Um, NASM minus F elf and exit dot ASM. Then I should do that link again. Now, I've got exit shell code, 544 bytes big of executable code. And of course, if I run it, it just exits. So it's pretty boring stuff, but it took 544 bytes to get there, and we wanna see how it works. So we're gonna examine it. We could do it with the disassembler. You can also use obsjump. Obsjump is present in almost every Linux distribution, and it's a good tool to get used to using. Obsjump has a variety of fun features, which we are gonna use a lot later, like it will show you the global relocation table to make it easy to find pointers to overwrite. But right now, we just want the disassembly, so that's obsjump minus D. And that will show us how simple this shell code is. Obsjump minus D on our compiled shell code, which is exit shell. Okay, this is the active ingredient. This shell code is 10 bytes long. And they consist of a move zero in EDX, a move one into EAX, and an int 80. The problem is, by default, move is a 32-bit instruction. It moves 32 bits of data, so it moves 32 bits of zero into that register. And this moves 32 bits with a one in the right into that register and this. So it works if I compile it and run it, but I can't use it in an attack because nulls will terminate the string. So I can't inject it in a password or a file name or anything that I'm sending up to the server. So that's the problem with shellcode. Shellcode has these, because the whole point of almost all attacks is you confuse the system into accepting your input, which it thinks is text, and then later running it as code, I have to have input that is valid text and null terminates the string. So I certainly can't use nulls, and as you'll see in the project, there are often other characters I can't use depending on the particular program I'm trying to exploit. So, uh, however, we can test the shell code. In order to see that it runs, this is how you test it. This is sort of bizarre looking stuff. If you're pretty much good with your C and your pointers, you might be able to de deconvolute this stuff. You define a variable called shell code, then down here, you define a variable called func, which is a pointer to the address of something to run, and you set that equal to the address of your shellcode. This, by the way, is a nice way to demonstrate the same problem I was talking about. I defined just raw data storage up here, and the processor interpreted this as just data. Then down here, I defined a pointer to it, and I execute it. This is a Minimal case of the same thing I was talking about. And by the way, there's a technique in the violent Python book that sneaks viruses right past any virus by doing this. You define an array in memory, and it's in my uh, 124 class. Um, you define an array of data, and you put your virus in the data, and it's just harmless data, so it doesn't count. And then you point to it and execute it as code. So you can run it, but it's not under, doesn't look like an attack to the uh, processes to the antivirus. 
Anyway, so that's what this thing does. And so that will run your shell code. So that's uh, exit, test exit dot C. <coughs> so there it is. And that has my 10 bytes of shell code here, which it stores in memory, and then it just executes it from inside C. So I can compile that. And I think, yeah, I do need the executable stack here because it's storing that data on the stack. If you run it without the executable stack defense turned off, it will crash. So to make it run without crashing, you GCC, uh, take the output in test exit, and take the input from test exit.c, and then turn off exec stack attraction. And now you've got something called test exit, which will run and not crash. So this is what the C compiler does to test my shell code. And this is what you're going to write your own shell code. Of course, you have to have an easy way to test it. Now, Another thing to do is look at it with strace. strace is another useful tool. It's not included by default in Kali or a lot of Linuxes, but you can just apt get install it. strace does a stack trace. It will find out what's going on when I run this code. And what it does, you can see the last thing it does is run exit zero. And before that, it shows you all the things it did to run it. So first it ran exec VE, uh, which we're going to say much more later. This is what launches a new process. And then it's going to open and reserve parts of memory. And this stuff, which looks like gobbledygook, will actually be more and more familiar as we move forward in this class. Here we define a memory map. And notice how we protect it from read and write. And then we have other here's uh, Linux libraries coming in. You see these a lot when you disassemble things. And down here, we're going to have more of this protect read, protect exec. We're going to talk a lot about this. When you reserve a memory region, you reserve what permissions are on that region. And in Windows, in particular, there's a general defense for at least a decade, which is write or execute. You, you do not let any region be both writable and executable to stop people from writing self-modifying code. And many of the exploits we're going to use are involved in turning off these defenses because these defenses make it hard to do the evil things we're trying to do, which is the whole point. Here's memory protection models being set. All these are reserving areas of memory and putting the right permissions on them, and then it runs exit zero. So that's all the overhead. Yeah? Is that the zero one? Uh, no, the exit zero is what we actually wrote. Oh, okay. and, and the zero is just the return value. You can, you can write a routine and exit, and the zero is the value it returns. So you can say, if good thing happened, exit zero. If error one happens, exit one. If error two happens, exit two. And then the calling program can look at that value to decide what happened and print an error message. This is that example of good coding I was talking about. The real code retirers spend most of their life thinking of all these situations and returning code numbers for it all, which the evil hackers don't bother with. So when anything goes wrong, our code just crashes, which is why professional coders hate the way we do things. But it's very different. You would never take the kind of code attackers write and then sell it to people, which is kind of why the uh, attack classes around here are such a mess. Like you've, you're one of the fine example. This week you found out not only is VMware shot, but if you get to project three, you'll find out the Metasploit is shot. All week Metasploit has not been working because attack tools are written by people that don't think like real programmers. <laughs> and they, in fact, they, what they did this week was they put an extra comma in one line of Metasploit, which broke every attack. Every single attack has been crashing. And the current discussion I saw on the boards is, how can you have so little testing that you didn't even try this? They said, I thought at least you would try MSO 867, which is the most famous attack in the last 10 years. And how you must not have even tried that this time because you broke everything. And then you pushed it out to production and everybody's out there screaming, especially since imitating Microsoft, Kali now automatically updates everything all the time. So you always have the latest buggy version, even when you didn't really want it. It's Pretty annoying. You know, whoever, you know, whoever, whoever thinks that updating fixes problems is living in a dream world, which is Microsoft's specialty. I mean, I, I even Microsoft tells you don't put on an update until you test it first. Updates, updates trade the old problems for new problems. That's what they do. Anyway, um, all right. So now we got to get rid of those nulls. So as we saw, this code is kind of horrible. It's all full of nulls, and that's going to ruin our whole day when we try to inject it in text. So let's get rid of them. And the way you do it is you just have to choose other instructions. So moving 0 into EBX is going to be full of nulls because it moves 32 bits of 0 into a 32-bit register. So what you do is you XOR EBX with EBX. Now what that will do is whatever value is in EBX, 
Wherever there's a zero, it will leave it alone, and wherever there's a one, it will flip it to zero. So it'll flip all the bits to all zeros, so it will have the result of putting a zero in there, but it doesn't explicitly reference the number zero. And here's one, move EAX1. This moves 32 bits of data into EAX, most of which are zero. So what I do is I use the old legacy 8-bit version. So only put a one in the lower eight bits of A. Now there's something, people do this all the time, and there's one thing I've always wondered, what if there was something in the other bits? I'd have to, I haven't got around to writing assembly code that fills A with like other numbers and then moves to eight bits, but logically I would think there's a possibility after this that the value is not really one. <laughs> but it's one plus 256 or one plus 65,000 or something. But anyway, people don't seem to worry about that. And maybe in practice, this is what you do. So now you take this shell code and you replace it with this shell code. Instead of moving zero in EBX, you XOR it with itself. Instead of putting one in EAX, you put one in, EA, in AL. And now you have index 80. So you can run this one. And when you compile it and take it apart, you'll see that instead of being 10 bytes long, it's only six bytes long. Because this, instead of having these two first two commands used to have four byte long words, but now they just have one byte. 31 dB is XOR, EBX, EBX, and B001 moves one into um, the lower eight bits of A. Yeah. You could. The question is, can you subtract like 92 from 92? The problem is 92 is a 32 bit number. So it'll be all full of zeros. But what you could do is have like F, 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 and subtract it from itself, and that would probably be okay. Yeah, this is why another fun thing, by the way, is when we get to a NOP sled, traditionally, you can even have virus scanners to look for NOP, 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 and you could totally do something else. Like you could just do this XOR EBX for DBX over and over and over again. You could save EBX somewhere, XOR a million times, then put it back, and that would be a NOP sled. It would not be equal to a NOP sled. ID virus wouldn't detect it and all that, but people just don't bother. There's um, there's lots of alternatives. That's the cool thing about assembly. There's many ways to do it. This is, this is the traditional one. I think this is the one that's actually fastest. So C compilers will like to do this XOR thing. They'll almost never load an immediate zero. But anyway, yeah, you totally could. Yeah. Um, how does the compiler know if it's uh, work, uh, 32 bit or 8 bit? <laughs> Um, the question is, how does the processor know 32 or 8-bit? Uh, the processor is always 32-bit, and you have these particular instructions uh, like AL. The AL here tells it to, in fact, only operate on 8 bits. It has a few, it's always really a 32-bit processor, but it has a few instructions that are there that do only move 8 bits at a time just for legacy brief. So they'll have a different uh, string here, AL instead of EAX, and you have a different code here. If you're moving, notice it's B0 is the um, active ingredient, the upper end. The uh, B0 is the verb which you call the operator, the mnemonic. They call a mnemonic move, and this is the operator, B0. And up here, the operator was um, B8. So B8 is what takes 32 bits and puts it in EAX, and B0 is what takes 8 bits and puts it in EAX. See, I learned, I when I saw, started doing assembler in the 90s or the, no, the 80s, maybe even now it's the 80s. Um, I had an 8 bit processor, and you had to, the only way to do it was to write these stuff in base 10 and poke it in from basic. And I remember 169 was A9. That was what loaded the accumulator at that time. And there was only one register, the accumulator it was A. Then later on, there was AX and BX and then EX and the, anyway, that's the game. So this AL is what tells it you're running in 8 bit mode. This EBX tells it you're running in 32 bit mode. Yeah. What's that? Oh, no. Um, some instructions are longer and some are shorter, but the simplest and most common ones are single byte. Um, things like... Well, there's only two what? Yes, exactly. The, this, this command, move one into AL, is a two bytes. This is total, six, eight bits and eight bits. That's all it takes. And a NOP is only one bit, only one byte. Some of them are five or six bytes. Some instructions are longer. Like these ones back here were five bytes long because they had to have this long text. So that BB means the next 32 bits are, are the argument for it. But that other code tells it to only use the next eight bits. 31 tells it only should be. So each instruction is a different length and you have to like read the manual and learn how they work. All right, these are very good points, yeah.
Uh, well, you are, the, you are allowed to refer to certain pieces. AH and AL are the higher and lower 8 bits, so the right-hand 16 bits. And there's something else that refers to the left 16 bits and the right 16 bits. I think EA, H and EAL or something like that. There's a, there's, by the way, you cannot refer to just any 8 bits. There's just certain ones that are available to you. Uh, because, and they're there so that a compiler could easily run 8-bit code. And uh, this is a convenience for things like Microsoft. Microsoft, every version of um, Windows supports the previous version. So you can run 32-bit code on a 64-bit machine, and you can run 16-bit code on a 32-bit machine, which is extremely useful in the commercial world where people are trying to get things done and they have old software. Um, Linux totally doesn't. Although you can add optional libraries, it doesn't. And that's one of the many irritations about using Linux in business. Um, Microsoft puts an enormous amount of effort into supporting old legacy stuff, which is very important for business, but it leads to a whole lot of security problems. There's all these really old things still in use on Windows because plenty of companies have something like the cash registers that were put in 20 years ago under Windows 3.1, and they're still working, and don't tell us we have to upgrade them. And there's a way to keep using old junk on Windows forever. Anyway, so now we're going to spawn a shell. So all we've done is exit so far. So if we were to actually eject this exit code and run it, all it would do is freeze the server. So this is a denial of service attack. And that's not very exciting. You could do that with a lot of things, um, just any kind of illegal instruction. We could just inject garbage on the server and execute and it would have the same effect. So we want to do something a little better. So here's the plan how you make real shell code. You write it in some high level language like C and then compile it and disassemble. Then you look at the assembly and then you rewrite it in assembler to get rid of all the forbidden characters. <laughs> and then you're, then you're ready to go. Because of course the compiler will totally not understand that it needs to ignore nulls and stuff. And compilers don't come with options to skip nulls. Attack tools like Metasploit do. But normal compilers are not in the business of making attack code and they do not give you these options. So um, therefore you're ultimately going to want to run a different process. The original process is doing something like it's a Microsoft DNS server or something. You want it instead to let me execute code on the system. So I have to somehow run different code than what the developer put on the system. So I have to launch a new process or I have to change the contents of an existing process, like the things I was talking about uh, at the start of class, those 10 ways to run alien code on Windows. The main way you do it is fork and exec DE. Um, I don't know if this is true of the latest versions of Linux, but what I've been told is, until recently, all processes on Linux are created with fork. When Ping first boots up, it launches init, and init fork makes two copies of a process. The old one continues, and a new one starts from here and branches off. And all the processes are children of init. And you can see it in Process Explorer, which we're using in the uh, malware analysis class. You can see that there's first the window starts, then there's login process. After you log in, it launches Explorer, and everything you launch, like Microsoft Word, is a child of Explorer. That means it forked from Explorer. And so anyway, this is the fork is usually how you create a new process and keep the old one going. This other one is exec VE. Exec VE replaces the current running process with the new one, so it stops executing, which is more brutal, and that's the one we're going to use here. And here's what the man page online says about exec VE. Exec VE executes the program, and down here it tells you it executes the program, causing the program that is currently being run to be replaced with a new program, which is kind of nuts, but this is interesting and one way to go, and that's what we're going to do. So it's good, clean, fun. Notice it brings in um, arguments, a file name, a pointer to a list of values, and then another pointer to a pointer. Three arguments come in, and we're going to have to set three arguments and call exec VE to do this. So here's a C program to use exec VE. This is going to run the command we put here in this thing called shell zero. So we define an uh, array with two entries, character pointers. This one has a command line to execute. This one has null. And then we call it with a pointer to the um, first element and a pointer to the whole structure, and then null. Those are the three arguments we need. And when you run this, this will actually do something. So let's um, exec VE. Let's give that a shot. I'm going to move it down here and get my demonstration up. So we're going to play a few games with this. So this is um, exec VE dot C. Okay, so there it is. And I'll get rid of the colors. So this... Um, this is going to run this. Now, in case you don't know your Linux shells, let me pause to talk about that. 
Right now, I'm in the bash shell, which is why it's giving me this helpful information like what directory I'm in, but there are other shells here. If I run bin slash sh, I'm now in a different shell. It looks different. For most practical purposes, they work the same. The only difference is the bash shell is a heavy shell intended for human interaction that does things like have a history list and some shortcuts and stuff. This is a simpler shell. I think in Kali, it is the dash shell, which is just smaller and stripped down. And most commands run the same, but there's a few commands that would not run the same. So for our purposes, they're fine. I'm going to exit the, the SH shell and get back to the bash shell where I like to live. But for our purposes, uh, by the way, this one is root shell and this one is also root shell. So there's no value in spawning that other shell, but it is just something we can see. So we know our shell code is working. So we're going to write a code that does that. It executes bin.sh and puts me in this other shell just so I can see the result. So now I've done it, I compile it. Now, if I have to do it static, like a lot of our projects, because I wanted to compile it in an old fashioned way instead of making modern complicated code that would crash on me for this kind of thing I'm doing, an exec.c, that will compile it. And now this exec ve gives me the dash shell. So this accomplishes the same thing as typing that, but it does it under my control. And now I can look, let's exit from this one. And that's static linking. Now I can look at it uh, by disassembling main. So let's GDB, the program you just made, which is exec VE, and now disassemble main. Okay, now this should be increasingly familiar to you. This is the prologue messing around with the stack pointers, rounding it off near a 16, making room for local variables. Then it calls this PC thunk thing, which I forget what it is, but it's a standard boilerplate thing. And then it's going to go down here and down around 50 is where I'm going to find the goodies, which we'll call exec VE. So here's where it makes the system call. And remember we talked about this before. Every time you do a Function call in assembler, it's always push, push, call. You put your stuff on the stack, then you call, and the calling routine expects the arguments to be there on the stack. So here we are putting a zero someplace on the stack, loading some address, then pushing EC on this one, expects the arguments to be in registers. So it puts something in ECX, puts something in EDX, puts something in EBX, and then calls exec VE. So exec VE has some arguments to work on. All right. And remember, there were three arguments for exec VE. So it was these three pushes that loaded the argument. And then we went in. So, uh, excuse me, not three pushes, but three setting. ECX, EDX, and e EBX were set here. So we had to put four parameters in. Um, and then, oh, this is um, exec CVE. So let's, let's take a look at the function. So this function called with three parameters, but it called a function called exec VE. We have to disassemble that one. Disassemble, exec, VE. There we go. There we are. This is the one that ends in a syscall. That is an int 80, called GS. That is the modern form of int 80. So this is what it does. It puts something, it saves the old EBX. Then it puts um, contents from the stack in EDX, another one in CX, another one in BX. These are the arguments it found on the stack because they're pushed there when we called. And then it puts a 0B, which is 12. It's 11. It puts 11 in EAX. And then it does an int 80, uh, syscall. So it's going to call syscall number 11, and it's going to find the other arguments there. That's what exec CVE is. And I think I still have the page open with the Linux reference. So let's take a look at the next page of this. And uh, there it is, exec CVE, syscall 11. And here are the arguments that it uses. Uh, pointer to something, very different pointers to the same string, and then an extra one at the end. Um, all right, that's the joy of exec CVE. And here's the page I looked up this morning to understand what's going on with that crazy syscall. This explains to you, in the old days, there was int 0x80. Now, for some reason, there's three things that do the same thing. Int x80, call percent gs x10, and call percent del sysinfo. They're the new modern extra complicated ways of jumping through extra things, which then calls int 80 for you. 
and I'm sure there's some brilliant reason why you need them, but I don't really care. So, uh, so now what you have to do, now we have got code that will launch that shell. Now all we have to do is compile it and figure out how to write it better, and I'm not gonna go through it. They go through it in your book, but here's the final assembly code translated into shell code um, using these things like AL to avoid having any nulls. So that is the shell code. Now what it does is, it has to have somewhere to put those arguments, so it has these extra letters down here. It's going to execute bin sh, and then it has j a a a k k k here. That is just reserving some space to put the arguments, which are stored there temporarily before they're shoved up onto the stack. Uh, we'll use this quite a lot in our later exploits, where you reserve some space by having some extra characters. So these dummy values are used to um, store things on the way. And that creates our final shell code, which we can run in C, and it's exec CVE shell here. So exec VE uh, exec. Exec VE shell, no underscore, okay. Nope, all right, what did I do wrong? LS is what I'm trying to type. Um, oh, it's test exec shell code, oh, I forgot, okay. Test exec shell be shell dot C. Okay, there it is. So that's the shell code. Let's get rid of the stinking colors. All right, so um, that's what the final shell code looks like. You know, it looks like about 50 bytes of assembler. And this is exactly the same code you saw before that will just, uh, or similar to it, that will just define the pointer to that array as a function and then execute it. So now when I run that one, test exec there it spawns the dash shell without an error message so now i can do anything because all i have to do is replace uh this let me get it here test exec all i have to do is replace the c code in this thing up here that's a command i can now do any kind of command i want with this so that's a general template for shell code all right, well, I got us some uh, cahoots. Let's try them. All right, and uh, I guess I don't already have cahoot open. I'll close some extra windows and get down to here. Okay. And my cahoots are here, and supposedly I made it a favorite. There we are. Okay. Oh, and I forgot to mute the people on mine, but I guess there aren't, they haven't been complaining, so maybe they haven't been being noisy at each other today. All right. I need to learn how to disable the webcam feature in Zoom. It quits popping up webcam images all the time during the lecture. There's probably an option somewhere to do that. Don't let me forget to have a survey about VMware. I'm going to tell everybody, I'll do this first. So, it looks like we got enough players, let's do it. Okay, so how do you get from user mode to kernel mode? Okay, that's what syscalls do. All right, which one will list all the syscalls when you run a program? Yeah, that's S trace. All right, so what should you use instead of move AX zero in shell code? Oh. 
Okay, X or something with itself, that's the typical thing you use. All right, which one of these will convert executable code into assembly language? All right, Objdump does that, takes executable code into assembly language. Most people never use assembly language. They're writing things like C, they compile it and run it. And if you only have the executable like malware, then you use Objdump or GDB to get back to the assembler to look at it. But the assembler was never written by a human. It's computer generated to make it a little easier for you to interpret the binary. Very few people code directly in assembler. And they are very proud of themselves for being able to do that. There's a whole cadre of elite people that write in assembler. Anyway, um, all right. So what would you do to, for move EAX1 in shellcode? All right, you typically do this move AL1. This, like I say, I kind of wonder if this is exactly right. What I would think a more perfect answer would be to do this, XOR, EAX, EAX, and then do increment. Then I would know there's a one in there, but in practice, this seems to be considered good enough. And that's what I mean when I talk about the, the sleaziness of attackers. They're perfectly happy to do something that is not 100% right all the time. Defenders can't be thinking that way. <laughs> and normal software developers, yeah. Yeah, the reason that's the case is Oh, so syscall doesn't see the higher bench. Yeah, it doesn't look at it. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Ah, oh, I thank you. Well, good. Okay, so it is all right. Thank you. Good. I really appreciate the help. If anybody else has helpful information, bring it up because I certainly don't understand all this but completely and I'm not pretending to. Um, so, good. Thank you. That helps. All right, so which item is converts assembly code into object code? Okay, that's NASM. All right. All right. So I got winners, and I'm going to make a record of my winners. Kaz is a real name, and I think MEU is a something close to a name. We can figure out who that is. And Ken Tan looks kind of like a real name, too. All right. So supposedly, those are the people that get extra credit. And I think I'm not planning to work through one of the projects today. I think you people are ready to go ahead. Um, you should be doing these. And really, I'll just uh, say a few words about it. You, so we've already talked about how to use Jasmine, and we've done the buffer overflow without shellcode, where you just get the U win. I saw a bunch of people turning that in. So the one with shellcode is just more of the same, and we are not going to write our own shellcode in this project. There are some projects later where you do a little bit of this stuff. But like I say, assembly is not our main thing here. What you do is you've got a um, that's address space. You got a program here with a buffer overflow, only room for 100, and you ex compile this thing and exploit it. And now, in, as we've done before, you know how to exploit it and gain control of the extended instruction pointer, which is fine. And so pretty soon you'll have a one here where here's the stack. Let me get it fitting on my screen nicely. So you hit a point where you have the stack frame and there's the stored value there. 0804 is a real program value. And so if you overwrite the stack with A characters, you put a bunch of A's in there. So now you control the instruction pointer. So the next step, as we've done before, is to carefully adjust your exploit. So you put chosen characters there, one, two, three, four, instead of just A's. So now you know exactly which bytes hit the EIP, and now you could do what we've done before. You could point to code that was there and run code the programmer didn't want you to run, like the uwin message. But we're going to take the next step here, and the only step is to run shellcode. And for here, we're just going to get the shellcode from online. This is shellcode like what we just made that just opens Dash. In fact, you could probably use exactly this stuff from the lecture today, and it would work too, but I think it's a little longer. And then you put in a NOP sled before it. So here's 64 NOPs followed by that shellcode, and you inject, you put that on the stack. And this is the process that we haven't done before, so I wanted to point it out. Now you, what you do at this stage of an attack is you put 
you have figured out what shell code you want to run and you know how to control the EIP, there's another step which is all important. You have to continue to put in fake value in the instruction pointer, but put in your shell code and your NOP sled and then put a breakpoint in the code so that what you do is you stop after the overflow but before the program crashes and then you look it stopped here's the value i injected one two three four here's my knock sled and shell code you have to break it and examine it here to find out what address to put in your shell code you have to inject your stuff and hunt for it and find it now you know where it is so you come here you have to look here and read it's bfffff 370 would hit somewhere in my knock sled so that's what i need to put here that's a something we have not done before, and I wanted to mention it. So that's the point. Now you can choose an address like BFFF370, and that's what you put here in EIP, backwards, BFFFF370. And when you do that, you'll now have, um, when you break, hit the breakpoint, it'll show you've injected that, and when you continue, you'll now execute a new process, bin dash. So that's shell code that launches a new process of dash and gives you that prompt, which is all this shell code does. And the next step, which I think comes in the next project, is you just use MSF Venom to make real shell code that does something interesting, like reverse shell. This is, again, just a proof of concept. But that's the point. And um, one other thing that will really annoy you. When you get your shell code working in the debugger, it will not work in a real program, typically. This is very annoying, and I have read many learned treatises about it. What they say, the GDB is not perfect. GDB is not completely the same as running it in the shell. Why it is, I don't know. But it, I've read that it's just because it doesn't have the environment variables and it doesn't have the whole path names of the program, so that should only be a few dozen bytes. But in practice, things are wrong by a really large amount. And um, there are two solutions. One available to us, not available to real people, is you can rewrite your code to print out a pointer and run it in GDB and run it outside GDB and see how much the pointer moves. That's the, but, but the other thing is just random guessing. So you write an exploit. Remember this address, we, this is why you need the not sled. This address we put in, we chose here, VFFF370. And we made a not sled, so even if this was off by 10 or 20 in hexadecimal, 16 or 32 bytes either way, it would still be okay. If you make your not sled really big, like 500, you won't have this problem because it's going to be off by a lot. I've never seen it off by more than 80 hexadecimal. That's a lot. Eight times 16, whatever, 128. I've, it's amazing how much is wrong, and it goes up sometimes and down sometimes. If you don't have a huge not sled, then you will just have to adjust your exploits. You take this value you ejected. BFFF 370 and just change it. Try 380, 390, 383, B, 3 C, then try 350, 330, 310. You'll have to mess with it to make it run outside the shell. It's very annoying. And this is true of almost every attack we're going to do on Linux in this system. You're going to have to just play with it. Getting it to work in the debugger is most of it, but now there's an irritating trial and error process afterwards to make it work out of the debugger. And there are some people that have written long blog posts try, trying to explain why this happens and how you could figure out, but I've never understood them. Maybe some of you will be motivated. If anybody figures it out and finds some good way to do it, let me know. But I just do it by trial and error. So don't panic when your thing works in a debugger and it doesn't work out of the debugger. That happens all the time. Anyway, um, I often get a lot of emails from students. It won't work. What's wrong with it? Yeah. Is there a tool to write the code to uh, What's that? Is there a tool to convert the shell code back into a readable assembly? Yes, um, Objdump can do it and GDB can do it. Yes, you can take any kind of executable code and you can read it. That's the point. That's what these tools you're using do. Yeah, you could totally find out what this is. If you just take this, um, what I would do, you could even disassemble these one by one by hand. Um, you could also put it in that C program and disassemble it. Uh, you could also, there are online tools that can do it. Um, I'm not sure an easy way, I'm not sure trivial to turn this right ahead of stands. The easiest thing I would do is put it in a C program, have a couple of those lines down here with those parentheses and stuff, and then compile, and then, um, compile it, and then look at it in GDB. That's how I would do it, but as far as just literally copying this text into something and then seeing assembly, I'm not sure I know something that does that all in one step. Although it would be pretty easy to do. Um, 
Another thing you could do, I think, is you could put this in a hex editor and save it as a straight hex file and then disassemble it with objdump. That might work, but you might need some header information or something. It might be fun to try that and see. Um, it's a good question, actually, and that would be actually a good project to really learn about this stuff would be to figure out various ways to turn this into something you can read and exactly what gets added by these various techniques. But all of them involve adding extra code before and after it to set up the environment. Yeah, I don't have that much of a good answer. Be a good project. Any others? Well, I think that's all I'm going to show you today. I'll go up to the lab in 2.14. I can help anybody who wants to work on projects. Oh, oh, one thing I wanted to make sure and announce. Um, students who use Windows machines this week have been getting totally hosed by VMware. And I complained about it on Twitter because it was horrible. My whole 123 class seems to be unable to do their homework because VMware just totally does not work. And when I put this on Twitter, the VMware people contacted me and said, no, VMware is fine. It works fine. I say, well, I don't think so. So I've, because I've seen plenty of people suffering. So I, you can get five extra points by filling out my survey. I want a list of how many people. Now, if it's working, I'd like to hear that. They're trying. Several people said, "Oh no, I have thousands of customers using on Windows. Everything is fine." And I say, "Dude, it is not fine. I've had you can't. Our own lab machines can't run it at all. And students come to me with their laptops. Like him, I must have spent four hours helping him do it. And he spent ten hours out of here. We can't make VMware run at all anymore." It, there's a serious problem, and VMware is pretending it's not happening. So I want, so you can get extra points by filling out my survey, and um, I, after I, I get maybe some data there, then I'll go to them with the chapter and verse of these ten machines that don't work. Yeah. Do what? Oh yeah, you can still do the quizzes anytime, and there's no punishment until next week for being late, and you'll even be able to do them forever late. I'll just take two points off for being late eventually. Uh, oh, after midnight. After midnight on the day they're due. Although this time, nothing is late until next week because people just are still at it until today. Okay, so in the future, like, I would have to log on the same. This the Saturday that passed after class. Right, uh, that's true. You're right. Now that you mention it, I intended to make it do half an hour before class so people weren't doing it during class, but there's no way to do that in Canvas that I can find. So it's only going to mark you late. Well, no, wait. That's a very good, I think I did mark that. I think you're right. If you don't take it before class, Canvas will mark it late. Now, to be fair, actually removing the points is a manual process, and I may or may not get around to it. But <laughs> what my, yeah, doing it before class is the best. Um, the, I, what I'm planning to do is add an extra column, points lost for being late, and put in man minus two for everything that's late. Uh, but, you know, I'm having enough troubles with Canvas and other things. I may actually not get around to that. This whole punishing people for being late, my heart is not in it in case you can't tell. I used to completely ignore it, and then everybody did everything in the last week, and I said, well, this is actually not working out too well. I have to put in some kind of late penalty, but my heart is really not in it. Uh, but my grader certainly likes it better this way. Yeah. Oh, I'll talk. Good, thank you. Anyway, so fill out that survey if you have anything to say. If it's working for you, I would like to know. If it's not working for you, I'd like to know because I'm currently being told that I'm just making it up. There's nothing wrong with VMware, and I don't think that is true. <laughs> that's, if you found any way to make it work, that's extremely interesting, because I tried everything I knew, and there's no way to get it to work at all. What did you do? I, I tried so many things I couldn't tell you exactly, yeah. but I will look back and see. Because we tried old versions. We tried every trick with a compatibility settings and structure. The only thing that worked is to get a version of Windows that had all the patches blocked and is a year old. Yeah, for me, it was on, it on Windows 8 and Windows 10. Right. I can, yeah, Windows 10 seems to be the real problem. Yeah, right. And I assume it's because of Microsoft's latest updates that broke something, but all kinds of people are telling me everything's fine, and I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. No. Oh, well. But if you don't, I, they won't let you do that. I think, I think you could run virtual watch. But anyway, um, what, I, what I am doing in my 123 class is using cloud machines, just putting everything in the Google Cloud, which I highly recommend. This whole desktop virtualization thing is a waste of your time anyway because nobody really uses it. It's just for training. But cloud machines, they really use. So I hopefully next, I've got it all working now to put all the machines in the Google Cloud. And I'm going to have projects written that way for 123. I'll have them up the next day or two. I just need to add little, little forms to get points. But you can totally do it all right up in the cloud. The other thing, which won't affect you but does affect other people, is this week, Metasploit doesn't work. So that's really rude. 
but they supposedly passed it a couple of days ago. So supposedly pretty soon it'll be, an update will fix it. Um, but anyway, so let me see if the chat message here is saying something I should know about. Where do we submit our project? Um, yeah, you'll find when you go to the, uh, you do email, at the end of each project, there's an email address in this class and you email in screenshots. In my other classes, you fill in a form and it puts your score directly in Canvas. This class, I have not upgraded to that yet. So I didn't want to do it to all my classes and then find out it didn't work. It is working pretty well though. So I think by next semester, I will switch entirely to that system. Um, all right, any other questions? And I'm going to stop the share and go up to the lab. And I'll be there for a while to help.